Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Priceless Podcast. This podcast is made in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups. The podcast is part of the We Want to Be Heard series. It is supported also by the HMS Foundation from Germany, where if you have an interesting project that you can propose, you can also ask for a donation or you can donate to help projects like this one so they can support this project. And of course, the link is in the podcast description. You can support this project, like you can do something for this podcast by sharing, liking, commenting. Uh, and of course, if you want to support uh, this podcast financially, you can do so. Just a short explanation. It was the wish of my guest not to be visible on video, but she sent a photo. So that's what you'll see during this interview. So today we have a new guest and I'm so honored and excited to have Farah with me. Uh, she's from Somalia. I grew up in Kenya and is now living in Berlin. I'm Farah Abdi, as Mihail said. Uh, I'm originally from Somalia. I grew up in Kenya. I came to Europe in 2012 as a refugee, uh, fleeing fear of persecution because of my gender identity. And the first four years of my life, I lived in Malta before moving to Berlin five years ago, and where I live now. Uh, I work for an organization called Transgender Europe, which is the biggest trans rights organization in Europe and Central Asia. I do their communications and I'm also an asylum uh, policy officer. Uh, I'm also an activist, uh, an author. I wrote and published a book in 2015 a motivational speaker. I've traveled all over the world doing motivational speeches. Somalis, predominantly over 99% of Somalis are practicing uh, or refer to themselves as Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims. And uh, that's what I grew up in and uh, who I was as my identity. Uh, I left a bit uh, when I came to Europe. Uh, I had this angry face whereby I was like, how can God create me like this and still take me to hell when I die uh, because of my identity? But over the last couple of years, I have fallen back in love with my with my with with my religion and with my with my background. I grew up in a very stable uh, uh, family and, and, and background. I went to a very good school. Uh, that's why I'm able to work today and be educated and write books and speak uh, uh, the language. Um, so every part of my childhood was absolutely breathtaking and beautiful. Uh, having been raised by one of the most powerful women in the world, my beautiful mother. Uh, and I lacked for nothing. But yeah, there was this part of my identity that I could not expose. Um, uh, that I figured out when I was five years old. Uh, and from the age of five, I knew that, yes, my life in every other way or in every other aspect is good, uh, apart from this part of my identity that will never be accepted by my family uh, because of their conservative roots. I think in one way it was very, very hard because I always say when when, 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 when kids are growing up, when they fall or when they hurt themselves, the first person that you run to naturally is your parent, is your protector, is the person that you feel safety and comfort in. And me and my mom up to today, we have one of the most beautiful relationships ever. I love that woman with every being in me. Uh, but it was very sad and depressing that I could not even tell my own mother of my own identity. Yeah, I think the fear of persecution mainly came from knowing or growing up knowing that of course, my mother and my family were not going to kill me or harm me, uh, but I lived in a society or in a country whereby colonialism had done its damage. Most of the anti-LGBTQI plus laws today that are being enforced in Africa were exported there by the colonialists, by the, the, by the Europeans. Uganda, which is one of the most homophobic countries in the world today, actually had a gay king an openly gay king before the British went there. Uh, so 
for me, most of the persecution came from this ugly part of colonialism and uh, society feeding into that. Uh, once uh, religion was exported there by the missionaries and the colonialists and African uh, uh, countries adopted those laws. Uh, so, for example, in Kenya, you could go to jail for up to 14 years uh, under the British code. Uh, that was uh, reinforced there when the British were there and the Kenyan government just uh, upheld it. Um, So for me, most of the fear was from the outside, not the inside. I think the LGBTQI plus situation in Somalia, in Kenya, is very, like, hard uh, and very complicated. The laws in Uganda were being uh, financed by evangelical groups from the United States. Uh, So there's a complicated and a well-funded and a well-established network uh, that is absolutely anti-LGBTQI plus rights around the world. Uh, And it's not something that because most people have this image that, oh, these things just happen in Africa or in the developing world or in countries that are supposed to be backward, because that's the image that the media and Western media tries to narrate. But no, that's not true. Look at Hungary and how anti-LGBTQI plus it is today uh, under Viktor Orban. And it's part of the European Union. Look at Poland, you know, which is a very anti-LGBTQI plus and is also part of the European Union. Uh, um, Look at uh, uh, Bulgaria. So, yeah, it's it's, it's kind of the same situation. Uh, There is a backlash against LGBTQI plus rights in Africa, but also in most parts of the world today. There's a very young generation today that is the social media generation that are becoming more connected to the world and more educated and more enlightened and more open-minded. So yes, I do have hope in the younger generation, but I think change is going to take a very, very long time. Most religions are very peaceful and accepting, you know, most religions, like who wants to worship a God that is uh, uh, not tolerant, who wants to worship a God that doesn't accept his people the way that they came into this world and their destiny and their, because I'm also a huge believer in the power of destiny, in the power of manifestation, in the power of doing good and expecting that good to come back to you. And when you look at most of these religious uh, 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 gatekeepers, uh, whether in Islam or in other religions, Uh, For me, I left religion because the gatekeepers of Islam kept preaching that all uh, uh, trans uh, trans people are disgusting, gay people are disgusting, and they will go to hell and uh, this and that, and there's hell and there's heaven and, you know, and when you hear that all the time from religious uh, leaders and religious teachers, then it, it, it sticks in your head. And for a long time, I, I, I battled myself with that. But then once you come and you grow up and you reflect on your own being and you reflect on what is going on around the world and you say, oh, wait a minute, why should I leave my spirituality and my connection with a higher power that I call God for these people? I'm not going to do that. And if if they say that Islam has no place for people like me, then I contradict them because they are not the gatekeepers of Islam. Allah is the gatekeeper of Islam and Allah is the one who created me and Allah is the only person in this world who can say if I am a Muslim or not. I live now in Germany for the last five years. I have a residence, uh, official residence here. Uh, I will become a permanent resident, inshallah, next year. I'm in Germany to stay forever, like, uh, my asylum is forever, like they cannot revoke it because I don't think the situation in Somalia will ever change, uh, at least in my lifetime. Uh, not just the trans issue, but also the war. Hopefully it does, but I don't think so. Uh, yeah, but Germany is my new home. It's my new country. Well, the process was very hard because Europe is seen as this uh, uh, hill uh, that is barricaded. Uh, Migration is always a very controversial topic across member states of the European Union uh, and mostly member states whereby refugees don't even want to go, like Hungary. Like, no, I have never met a refugee who tells me I want to live in Hungary or I want to live in Croatia or I want to live in Poland. 
you know, uh, most nationals of those countries are running away from those countries and coming to Western Europe for their own survival. So why would a refugee want to live there? But uh, yeah, it was very hard, especially in Malta, whereby I came from a society that was very homophobic, transphobic. And I found myself in a society which was becoming increasingly, Malta at the time, was becoming very increasingly tolerant of LGBTQI rights, but my intersectional identity was not going to be accepted. So the fact that I was a Muslim, the fact that I was a refugee, the fact that I was Black was a problem. And I tried to change things there for the first four years that I lived there. But after four years, I was like, no, I did not leave my mom uh, running away from one discrimination to end up in another discrimination. By the time I was coming to Germany, I had a very public profile uh, within the European institutions in Brussels. I knew commissioners, I knew presidents. So I was able to use those networks to get asylum again in Germany, which is unheard of because there's the Dublin regulation that states that refugees are supposed to stay in the first country that they arrive in. But my privilege and my connections it allowed me to come to Germany and to come to Berlin, which is, uh, yes, racism is still alive here. Yes, uh, there's a lot of barriers and challenges, but it is a lot, a lot better than places like Hungary and Malta and Croatia and Greece and all those places, yeah. Berlin is much more better than that and tolerant. Every single day that a person of color, whether they are black, whether they are brown, whether they're from the Middle East, whether they're from Africa or Latin America or Asia, wakes up, they think about race because it's constantly in your face. Like for example, something as simple as going to the supermarket uh, a black person goes to the supermarket, I have a totally different experience than a white person going to the supermarket because in the supermarkets, uh, which is something that I came to find out in when I arrived in Europe, and I was like, oh, like being followed around in the supermarket as a black person is normal because for some reason, these people think that black people are thieves or Roma people are thieves, you know, but they don't know that thieves come if, in every shape, color and form. So yeah, racism exists in that context and in that form, and it's there every single day to the point whereby it's very toxic that sometimes as people of color, we are always on the guard, that sometimes even when it's not racism, you're always questioning, oh my God, this person was rude to me. Maybe they were just rude to you because they're having a bad day. But the first thing that comes to your mind is like, oh my God, they're racist. I am a black trans woman uh, of a Muslim immigrant background. Uh, in the patriarchy ladder, I am at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to patriarchy. You know, I'm at the lower, lower end of privilege, you know. But still, I still question my privilege of speaking the language, of working, of making an income, of living in a beautiful apartment, of having the security to transition and to live my life and to live my truth, you know, in Berlin. Uh, so I question my own privilege in that sense. You know, every day that I wake up, I open my eyes and I see where I live and where I am and how far I've come. I accept my privilege and I say, okay, how can I use my voice to help other people? And that's why I wrote a book. That's why I speak up whenever I see an injustice. We should always look at our privilege, no matter how much our privilege is or how little our privilege is, and try to use that to help other people. I think most of my challenges, um, inshallah, mashallah, fingers crossed, are behind me. Challenges moving forward is, for me, completing my transition. That's a medical challenge. It has nothing to do with my refugee identity. Uh, and getting citizenship and finally like literally feeling like yes there's no right that i don't have today as as a refugee in germany uh, but getting that piece of paper would be the completion of that journey and i would be like okay now i'm officially german and i can travel the world as a german with all the privilege that comes with that there, there's always a way out it gets there's this campaign that was done in the United States a few years ago. It's it's called it get it it gets better. And when you're in the eye of the storm, it's very hard to believe that it gets better. And I didn't just magically drop 
in the middle of my pink box in Berlin in my apartment. It was a journey. So plan, have hope, never give up, and know that one day you're going to get out of everything that has ever stopped you from being yourself. Thank you, Farah, so much for taking your time and being part of this podcast and sharing your story and also giving us messages of hope. Dear viewers and listeners, thank you for being with us. As said in the beginning, this podcast is made in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups and is financially supported partially by HMS. Uh, and the link is in the podcast description. Subscribe, like, share, comment in the comment section and join us again for the next interview. So bye everyone and bye Farah.